Four of Canada's big six banks have reported so far. It's a bit of a mixed bag out there, but one thing is consistent. They're all expecting higher credit losses this year. Apple is pulling the plug on its self-driving car program. Wendy's is taking a page from Uber's playbook and testing surge pricing at some of its restaurants. And the pension landscape continues to change here in Canada. Today is February the 28th, 2024. Here are today's top stories. Four of Canada's biggest banks have now reported a Q1 2024 earnings. The last two are going to be out with their numbers tomorrow. Let's look at what's happened so far. Bank of Montreal reported on Tuesday and it missed the analyst expectations. Their fiscal first quarter adjusted net income came in at $1.89 billion. That's $2.56 per diluted share. That's down from the $2.16 billion or $3.06 share they saw a year ago. This also missed the analyst expectations of $2.96 for earnings. Revenue from the quarter was $7.67 billion. That was up from the $5.1 billion the company saw a year ago, but it was below analyst expectations of $8.37 billion. The provision for credit losses, this is something we're paying close attention to right now, that came in at $627 million. That's almost triple the $217 million they set aside a year ago. The adjusted return on equity was 10.6%. That's down from the 12.9% they saw a year ago. The company's board did declare a quarterly dividend, $1.51 per share. That's unchanged from the previous quarter. So a few takeaways from this report here. The bank's capital markets division, it reported net income of $393 million, and that's down 19% from a year ago. They cited lower trading revenue, countered by higher underwriting and advisory fee revenue. Their adjusted results were affected by a number of one-time items, and this includes also a, an assessment by the U.S. Federal Deposit Insurance Agency. That came in at $417 million before taxes. And that's related to the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Their gross impaired loans on commercial real estate, they continued higher up to $481 million for the quarter. The bank also announced a restructuring program last August, and they incurred a debt of about $340 million in severance charges um, over the past couple of quarters. Uh, savings from those efforts aren't expected to be fully realized until sometime later this year. Now, Bank of Nova Scotia also reported yesterday they came in with fiscal first quarter adjusted net income of $2.21 billion or $1.69 per diluted share. That's down from $2.35 billion or $1.84 per share a year earlier. But this did beat expectations of $1.61 per share. Revenue from the quarter, that came in at $8.43 billion. That's up from $7.96 billion a year earlier. Again, this beat analyst expectations, which were $8.25 billion. Provision for credit losses, again, a big number, $962 million, up from the $638 million a year ago. Adjusted return on equity was 11.9% versus 13.4% a year ago. The bank declared a dividend of $1.06 per share. That's up from the dividend of $1.03 a year ago, but it is consistent with the dividends for the past couple of quarters. So in other news uh, that came out in the report here, the bank said that loans at its international markets, and this includes parts of uh, Latin America, parts of the Caribbean, they were down 2% there. Expenses grew 4% in the same time period though. Uh, provisions for impaired loans, they were driven by uh, Canadian auto loans and unsecured lines and delinquencies in international banking retail portfolios, mostly in Colombia, Peru, and Chile. The Royal Bank reported its earnings this morning. They reported fiscal first year adjusted net income of $4.01 billion. That's $2.85 per diluted share. That's down from the $4.22 billion they saw a year ago and $3.04 per diluted share. It did beat analyst expectations of $2.79. Revenue from the quarter was $13.49 billion. That's up from the $13.36 billion a year earlier, slightly above the analyst expectations of $13.45 billion. Provisions for credit losses for fiscal Q1, that was $813 million compared with $532 million a year ago. Return on equity from the quarter was 13.1% up from 12.6% a year ago. The company's board of directors did declare a dividend of $1.38 per share. A few other takeaways from this report here. The bank said that the quarter included about $1.05 billion of an impact from the Canadian recovery dividend and other tax-related adjustments. I know we've covered those off here um, on the channel recently. The results were also impacted by specified items 
are related to the planned acquisition of HSBC Canada. That's something that's in the news right now. That deal is on the verge of closing the largest ever domestic banking deal. Uh, it's a $13.5 billion takeover of HSBC's Canadian unit, and that deal is expected to close at the end of March. National Bank of Canada also reported their fiscal first quarter adjusted net earnings this morning of $922 million. That's $2.59 per diluted share, up from $900 million or $2.54 per share a year ago. Those numbers beat analysts' expectations of $2.35 per share. Revenue from the quarter, $2.71 billion. That's an increase from the $2.56 billion they saw a year earlier. It's also right in line with analyst expectations of $2.71 billion. Return on common shareholders' equity for fiscal Q1 was 17.1%, and that's down from 17.9% a year earlier. The company reported provisions for credit losses of $17 million for Q1 2024. That compares with $9 million in credit loss recoveries recorded in the first quarter of 2023. Now, National Bank's uh, board of directors, they did declare a dividend of $1.06 per common share. That's for the quarter ending April 30th. In quite a surprising turn of events here, Apple has put the brakes on its much speculated autonomous electric car project. And this now marks the end of what was a, a pretty ambitious journey into this um, automotive industry for this company that's known so much for its, its iPhones. The decision was announced in a brief meeting to the project team on Tuesday morning. And this now signals a significant shift in the tech giant strategy with the termination of all the work on this project, the likely layoff of hundreds of employees who were involved. This development does come as the automotive sector in general, sort of at large, they're rethinking the entire approach to EVs, autonomous vehicles, amid these changing market conditions and of course the regulatory landscape which continues to evolve. Bloomberg first reported this project's cancellation. It notes that some of the team members will actually be transferred to Apple's generative AI projects. Others will be given a 90-day window to find new roles within the company. If that doesn't happen, they will in fact be laid off. The project, which was internally known as Project Titan, at one point they had around 5,000 employees working on this effort to compete in the EV space. And they wavered uh, between goals of creating an all electric vehicle to rival Tesla and then developing a fully autonomous car similar to those that are produced by, by Waymo. So this um, you know, pretty sudden announcement here was delivered by Apple's COO, Jeff Williams and Kevin Lynch, who's the vice president in charge of the project. It didn't, it didn't allow for any questions there. And this sort of reflects the project's tumultuous history and the shifting priorities that it's had in the role that it's played at Apple over the years. Project Titan itself, uh, it saw a, what they call a revolving door of high profile automobile executors. They had a, a former Tesla executive, uh, Doug Field. He was in the team then left and also experts from Lamborghini, Ford and BMW. So this just sort of highlights the, the um, ambitious nature of what uh, the approach that Apple took towards their automotive goals. Something that really stands out to me here, the cancellation of this product, uh, this project rather, just underscores the complexities and the challenges of breaking into the automotive industry in general, um, even for a massive powerhouse like Apple. There's very little doubt that uh, one issue with traditional investing education is that there's so much to learn just to bring yourself up to speed. And a lot of people get overwhelmed quite quickly. That's one of the major objectives that we set out at our investing academy is to provide our students with proven investment approaches but at the same time, try and make it a fun experience and remove that intimidation factor. When I retired from a 25 year career, I was an investment advisor, a portfolio manager. And when I did, I actually joined my son, Brandon, who had started the Investing Academy a few years earlier than that. Uh, Brandon actually worked for me in his early 20s, he spent a couple of years working in the office there. He thought that he would rather spend his time reaching out using technology than sitting in an office with a bunch of seniors discussing their grandchildren. And you know, quite honestly, um, I don't begrudge that. It's probably a good decision for him. Now, if you're trying to get started, but you don't know where to take that first step, even if you're a more experienced investor, quite frankly, who just wants to up your game a bit, have a look at what we have to offer at the Academy. You can scan the QR code on this screen here, or you can click in the link of the description of this video. Wendy's is uh, making an effort here to shake up the entire fast food industry, and it's announced a pilot project to introduce dynamic pricing models where the cost of your meal will actually vary depending on the time that you're at the restaurant and also the demand at that particular time. It's a pretty bold move here. The company recently disclosed in an earnings call that is part of a broader $20 million investment in new digital menu boards, which are set to roll out in 2025. 
Now, Wendy CEO Kirk Tanner, um, he highlighted that this initiative, um, it takes steps towards integrating more sophisticated features like AI-enabled menu changes, suggestive selling, and it's aiming to optimize customer and crew experience. The strategy isn't entirely new, obviously. We, we have seen fast food giants like McDonald's, we've seen Coca-Cola already just sort of dabble in dynamic pricing. Uh, we've seen uh, McDonald's test it at select locations and Coca-Cola has been experimenting with vending machines in, in Japan to see how it would work out there. Um, obviously, we're familiar with Uber, Lyft, that type of company, they use dynamic pricing as a staple of their business models. The concept is certainly innovative when it comes to the fast food restaurant. Um, not unexpectedly, it's faced its share of criticism, particularly amongst the consumers who aren't used to seeing fluctuating prices for their everyday items. That said, the practice of adjusting prices based on demand and stock levels is uh, very common across various sectors. We just talked about the uh, ride sharing companies, they use it a lot. Um, also airlines, retail, uh, event tickets, that type of thing, they use, um, they, they leverage this technology to dynamically set their prices and you know it causes a lot of headaches if you're trying to book a flight or a ticket or something like that, they seem to change um, every second. Looking forward here, um, Experts are saying that dynamic pricing will become the future norm. They're citing potential benefits for both the businesses, businesses and the consumers. It allows businesses to manage their traffic demand more efficiently. I like that. Uh, potentially can lead to better working conditions for employees and enhanced consumer uh, quality. That's what they say. I'm a little bit more suspect about that one there. From a consumer's perspective, now de de depending on your flexibility, your price sensitivity, it could benefit you if you choose to purchase at times when the prices are lower. Wendy's claims that this strategy aligns their commitment to offering high quality food at a great value um, and provide value during less busy times. But, and this is a big but here, the implementation of surge pricing in the fast food sector uh, certainly could face some unique challenges. The industry here, I mean, let's face it, it's traditionally appreciated for its quick service, its consistent pricing, and critics argue that consumers who are accustomed to eating out at the convenience uh, without any price variations, they may be reluctant to embrace this, uh, this change. They could potentially seek out alternatives. The landscape of retirement savings in Canada continues to shift. Experts are noting now that there is a significant rise in the popularity of group registered retirement savings plans, or group RRSPs, a big reason for this trend is that with this type of plan, the, the, the responsibility for the retirement planning falls onto employees and it mirrors a decline in the availability of what we call the traditional registered pension plans where the employer is responsible for guaranteeing the retirement benefits. Recent data out from Deloitte Canada, it shows that only 24% of private sector workers are enrolled in employer-sponsored pension plans. And this just underscores the move towards alternative savings options like the group RRSPs. It basically confirms a changing landscape where group RRSPs have begun to dominate the retirement savings space. And this is a dramatic shift from the 60s and 70s when registered pension plans were you know, by far the dominant choice back then. It isn't exactly a great scenario for employees, but it's not all doom and gloom either. One positive note of this is that the uh, with a group RSP, Typically, there is a matching component where the employers are going to match the employee's contribution up to a certain level, and this provides an immediate return on investments even before uh, the market starts to perform for you. It's something that always puzzled me when I was active as an advisor. I always marveled at how many employees would take a pass on group plans even when the company was matching. Colin White, he's the president and CEO of Vericon Capital, um, he agrees with that. He pointed out that despite this benefit, many employees still fail to take advantage of group RSPs and they miss out on what he describes as free money. The rise of group RSPs is attributed to several factors, including the complexity and the financial liability of maintaining the traditional pension plans we just talked about. It's also especially relevant today in a workforce that's increasingly becoming more mobile. People are changing jobs more frequently. I'm always very appreciative that you've taken the time to tune into the program here. Thank you so much for doing that. Don't forget to subscribe to our Pulse newsletter that comes out every weekend. If you haven't already done so, visit our investment